I bet you don't know what we're going to talk about today. I'll give you some hints, though. It's legendary. It's beautifully recorded. And it's incredibly divisive. Any guesses? Scott Joplin. Yep. Scott Joplin, king of the ragtime writers. Yep. Finally, it's come to this channel. <laughs> it's, come, it's finally, at long last, yep. the requested video. No, actually, we're not going to talk about garbage. <laughs> we're going uh, to talk about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And uh, all that I just said, except for the garbage part, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is it truly really embodies what this movie is about. And I'm going to emphasize it's Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And that's really the reason this, this film is divisive. Now, this series, our number one worldwide trending series, mm -hmm. Stephen King's shit or hit. Nobody watches it. But no. the point is, we, we were about examining the films based on Stephen King's work. And that's really all you can say about this movie in terms of its relation to Stephen King. It's based on Stephen King's... It has the same name. Um, ...novel, The Shining. Now, Stephen King came out the gate a fighting and a scraggling his way up the bestseller list. And uh, he made quite the impression real quick. And uh, The Shining was his third novel. And it, like its predecessors, sold uh, quite a bit of copies. So it just so happened that at the same time, Stanley Kubrick had just suffered a colossal box office failure with Barry Lyndon, which people called epic, Lee Boring, that is. All right. And uh, again, uh, Kubrick is, I wouldn't even say he's an acquired taste because there's no, mis there, there, there is no argument that the guy's a master. But at, the, at this particular point in his career, Barry Lyndon, even for me, hit a... a particular low in the sense that it was beautiful but it was it did drag now for the wrong person any kubrick film can drag mm. because he is so meticulous and so paced but uh that was the the consensus shall we say so kubrick was looking for something that could get him back in the public eye in their good graces and yet something that he would not have to betray his artistic vision for and apparently he scoured the friggin' globe looking for something, anything. And surprisingly, he set his sights on Stephen King's The Shining. Exactly why? Uh, well, that's up for discussion. And uh, we'll definitely touch on some of those points, I, I believe. But that aside, that was what he chose. And he set out to make it. Now that, to anybody, especially at the time, a uh, fan of cinema or of... of, of literature would be exciting kubrick king mishmash together king himself was like fuck yeah bitch that's a quote yeah by the way direct <laughs> quote uh he, he crumped down, yeah, down, he, down he banger did. mains main avenue yep. that's my crump apparently he broke, broke his um, little ankle too but yeah man uh who wouldn't have been excited i mean if you wrote something and old kubi I'd, said, be, I'd be crumping yeah you'd be crumping uh hopefully not because that would send waves of yeah, odor my way like but sitting here Getting a muskratty smell. It's not great. <laughs> but yeah, man, it, it was cause for excitement. I don't think it was a person in the world that wasn't excited, except for maybe some people in like Papua New Guinea that were like... Don't give a shit. Yeah, they just want food. Spearing muskrats, yeah. just to bring that back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. Uh, but the film finally came out, and guess what? Old Stevie, that is to say Steve King, mm -hmm. said, Fuck that shit! Yep. What is this? <laughs> Who is you? <laughs> to the film, he said. Yeah, man. And you know what? Surprisingly, uh, critics didn't receive it as well as uh, they had previous Kubrick films, with the exception of Barry Lyndon, which they pretty much said, well, that stunk. Yep. But yeah, man, but as time passed, and this is often the case with Kubrick, the value appreciated on the film. And critics and audiences alike said, you know what? I think we were wrong here. Uh it's interesting that now I said Stephen King hated this. Uh -huh. It's interesting to note that if you actually read his comments on uh, the the movie as time progresses, he actually flip flops a lot. Mm. You know, he'll go from you know just vehement hatred to well, you know, this is good to putting it on a, on his top ten best horror films list. You know, etc. And he'll just go from one end of the spectrum to the other. And I think it's because he. Much like, and I'm going to put myself in shoes here, much like me recognizes subconsciously at least that this is 
a fantastic film. It's just a horrible adaptation. Mm. And that's such a strange place to be because as much as I love King, I can't say that The Shining is a good adaptation of the book because it's not. It's actually a terrible adaptation of the book. Now, before someone wants to go out there and lynch me, cut my old nutties off yeah, for saying, saying that. the movie stinks. No. You're saying that as an adaptation. Yes. It's not good. This is the way I'll put it. This is one of the few times where I feel that the movie transcends the book. That's not to say that I don't that I think the movie's better than the book. The book is a better horror novel. The better the book is a better story mm. about human elements, all ranges of human elements, and the book presents a much more compelling and fast-paced set of events. The movie, on the other hand, is a great piece of art. And I think that's what sets this apart. Uh, and on top of that, it is a very unique horror movie. Uh, you know, it, this type of horror movie to date has not been replicated. You know, uh, I'm looking at the back of this, uh, of this uh, Blu-ray and it says exactly the best way to describe it. And the review is the first epic horror film. And it is. But not in the sense of scale or grandeur or effects. It's just, it just is. And it's on the sheer human psyche that it, that it walks that line, you know? It's almost, it, I mean, I wouldn't even say it's almost like Psycho. It, it's above Psycho in that sense. But that's my opinion. I'm interested to see what you think because you've never seen this picture before. Uh, I know you're familiar with Kubrick or some of Kubrick's work. Uh, but not much of it. Hmm. I saw the opening scene of 2001. I was like, there's a lot of apes. <laughs> that's that's my that exposure. That's the review. Yep. Uh, no, and of course you've seen The Clockwork Orange. Oh, yeah, I and, have seen uh, that, yeah. But, yeah, uh, but you're not familiar with his oeuvre, so to speak. So I'm very interested to see what you think of this. Now, just to clear it up, once again, you haven't read the novel. Uh -uh. But what did you think of this I have seen the, ho the horrible adaptation later on. We'll talk about that in another video, yeah. but we're talking about this here Kubrickian version of The Shining. What what is your impression just having seen it? I liked it, but I'm not confused. It's definitely not confusion. It's more like I think I'm missing something. Uh and that, you know, is the response of most people upon first watching it. Uh, I remember the first time I watched it uh it was like my head was trying to solve a riddle at all times and oftentimes with kubrick's work that is the case you know sometimes that effect is lesser uh um, than others but it just depends on the film and this is one of those where it leaves you scratching the old noodle if you will because it is intentionally vague now before we get into that discussion of the what's and the where's and the who's and how's. Uh, let me just clarify a few things about uh, the film. It is legendary for a lot of reasons. Uh, but one of the biggest things it's legendary for is it's kind of tense, shall we say, shooting schedule. It took over a year to film this thing. Mm. He shot it in order. And if anybody knows Kubrick, they know that he was a meticulous and anal asshole about shooting stuff. Uh, you know, this is the movie that's that's gained a reputation for having shot one specific scene over a hundred times just to get exactly what he wanted on screen. This is also the movie that's renowned for driving Shelley Duvall over the fucking edge that she was already traipsing on, by yep. the way. Uh, but yeah, man, it, it has a reputation for being one of those almost vanity projects. Uh, and on top of that, it was a hectic shoot in the sense that nothing was ever secure for anybody. You know, uh, uh, Jack Nicholson just stopped remembering the script because Kubrick would change it yeah. on the fly. And he would just do as he pleased. And, you know, they, they were held at the whim of Kubrick. Everybody, the crew, much to their frustration, uh, you know, some people swore off ever talking to the man. Shelley Duvall hated him. And, you know... 
But it, it, it garnered a reputation thus that added kind of a different texture to everything that was going on on top of the one million themes that are playing out on the screen, whether they're actual themes that he wrote into it or themes that we just, as the uh, viewing audience, attribute to the film, whether they're there or not. So that's all fucking interesting to say before we get into it. But let's talk about it. Again, your reaction is you liked it, but you might be a little a little confused, maybe. A little off your uh, balance in terms of where yeah. the ups uh, this, and the downs. Not necessarily confusion. In a weird way, I kind of was... Like, the story's not really, like, anything... You know, it's a simple story. It's just, like, the way the movie's presented is kind of like... There's... Some, there's something else here I'm not get, catching on to here. Now to prepare, uh, on, on similar note, to prepare for this uh, uh, viewing so we could do this video, I reread the novel. I hadn't read the novel yeah. in over 20 years. I read this when I was a young teen. And I told you that it, 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 this film made such an impression on me that it was breaking my fucking brain <laughs> trying to fit the film into the novel because it doesn't and i was familiar with the novel of mm. course but it's been so long the thing is and this would attribute to a lot of stephen king's hate is that kubrick took the basic framework the events that happened in the novel pretty much happened here but he just took that framework and he filled in all the details with his vision of these events with his purpose for the characters and so one of the biggest criticisms Stephen King had about this was that it was no longer a horror movie. It was a psychological movie. And it is. But I think he misses one of the bigger things here. And that's that it is blatantly a horror movie. It just is so vague. Yeah, it, and it, it leads you down the wrong path for so long. And it doesn't, it doesn't present itself like a horror movie. At, yeah, at all. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that was very intentional. In fact, I know that was very intentional yeah. because everything that Kubrick did was very intentional. In fact, that's why people go back to his films over and over again, because no detail should go unturned in the Kubrick film. You know, people will comb entire scenes to get and piece together what's going on. So just to give you an idea of what the book is versus the movie, uh, First of all, one of the things I have to say about the book is that Jack is not immediately inherently unlikable yeah. as he is in the movie. And, and, and I will say that before you start that, because it does tie into what you're going to get into, mm -hmm. uh, I will say that watching the movie, I was like, I know this is completely different to the book. Right. And the whole time I was like, I wonder if this has changed or if that's changed or what. It, like the whole time I was questioning what was changed. What was going to... Yeah. Um, and it, and it, I'm not going to say it took me out of it. Uh, it didn't at all. It was just like, in my the back of my mind, I was like, I want to know what is different. And yeah. I haven't read the book, so I don't know what is different. And you are familiar with the style of Stephen King. So you almost, ex not in the cliche sense, but you almost expect certain things yeah. out of certain people. So I love that about the movie because it keeps me on my toes. Even knowing it being so familiar with it it still keeps me on my toes and like i told you that i had a hard time fitting the movie back into the book now going back to the movie i had the same thing going on in my head it's interesting it's, too because i kind of know like i kind of knew everything that happened in the movie mm -hmm. uh through you know because it's just one of those movies you see yeah. everywhere mm -hmm. but yeah i was still kind of like i didn't know where it was going for a lot of the movie oh i did know where it was going i just it was weird the route it took to get to there. Yes, exactly. And that, for anybody that read the book, would be incredibly frustrating to see things go the way they're expecting, but then not mm -hmm. at all. It, it, it was a case of Kubrick constantly pulling out the rug from under you. He never let you, the reader of the book, be comfortable at all. And on top of that, if you never read the book, he never lets you be comfortable in a completely different sense. So in that sense, it worked. It's interesting that you say that because on top of what we know about the movie, it originally got released with a different ending. Mm. The ending that we see now in the movie, the 144-minute cut anyway, is, is still the one that everybody knows, everybody's familiar with. 
you know, the, the, the last shot of Jack frozen in the maze and then the tracking shot towards the picture suggesting a variety of things. But yeah. uh, it originally had an, uh, an addendum to that and that was that uh, Wendy, his wife, Jack's wife, is told that the body was never found suggesting that the madness was in fact hers, not his, mm. that he was in fact just another thing, another facet uh, of the hotel, another ghost, if you will. Uh, but Cooper chose to take that away. And they, they had actually distributed this to theaters already. And he chose to take it off and leave it more vague. So that's why I tell you his intention to be vague is running rampant throughout this whole thing. So your confusion is not without founding, is not without basis. He was intentionally walking some very, very thin lines to try to keep you off kilter. It is, it is kind of interesting because uh, obviously I don't think this movie is one of those that has like a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. That's proven by the whole movie they made of theories. Yeah. Um, but there was some stuff in the dialogue that I picked up on that I had formed my own theory. And when that final shot happened, I was like, oh, that is what it was. Which is kind of cool because... I didn't even expect because I had never seen that final shot, so I was mm -hmm. like, "Oh, is this what that was?" Or it's it's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting that there is stuff there to kind of make you think of yeah your own little conclusion. Yeah, and the thing is, the answers are multitude, you know. And he laid so uh, again. You mentioned the film that's entirely about the variety of things that this film might or might not be yeah. saying. It's called Room Two Thirty Seven. If you haven't seen it. If you've seen the movie, check out Room 237. If you haven't seen the movie, don't do that because then it'll just be like, what? And I got to say that I watched the majority of Room 237 and it got to one of the theories that just pissed me off because it was so ludicrous. Mind you, that's the point that it's showing the gamut of theories yeah. that there are. But one of them was just so fucking ridiculous that I was like, what the fuck are they even spending time on this theory for? But whatever, it's, it's, it's a great film in the sense that it gives you an idea of how much people have, you know... Uh, reached into this film and yeah. pulled it apart and examined it and uh, it was kind of yeah it was kind of cool that as like someone who wasn't even looking for that i kind of picked up on certain little things and formed my own little theory which i didn't think was going to happen and at the end i was like oh that kind of supports my little theory but obviously it's not you know like this is what it is in fact we'll get into that what you think what i think and we'll discuss that uh but before we get there let's let's get to uh like I said, the, the book doesn't present Jack as immediately unlikable. Mm. In fact, I, and again, I think that was intentional from Kubrick in the sense that it was a way to quickly show that Jack was a troubled man. Because although Jack in the book is not immediately unlikable, we do get a long introduction as to the problems that the family has had before. Instead of just suggestions yeah. of his drunkenness, and his terrible temper. In fact, in the book, we spend enough time to realize that this is a man who does love his family, who does want to do good, but he is severely hampered by his vindictiveness, his pettiness, and that temper, man. And of course, the ghost of his alcoholism, which, you, you know, any addiction never really goes away. It's just you fighting it. And as a result of that, in the book, his descent into madness creeps on you, if you will, to take something from the book. It creeps on you because the hotel or, or uh, exploits his weakness to make him do his bidding. So he's fighting what the hotel wants and what he wants as a petulant person against the part of himself that wants to take care of his family. So he's doing the bidding of two masters himself and the hotel and and on that note another thing that is very clear in the in the book is that it is the hotel manipulating yeah. jack whereas in the in it's the movie not. it makes it incredibly vague until one exact moment when it becomes stark clear that there is a supernatural element and this is what i think king missed and uh i understand why he missed it and i understand why some people will still leave it up to vagary and it's it it's that it took so long for that to be definite in the movie you know uh for one he doesn't clearly define the psychic abilities of the shining uh kubrick 
He doesn't clearly define what Jack is seeing, courtesy of his own mind and and possible cabin fever, as is suggested in the book and the movie. Uh, but doesn't clearly define that until one point. In the book, it comes out... Um, well, <laughs> Wendy stabs him in the book instead of hitting him with a baseball bat. Mm. But she stabs him. And at that point, there's a switch thrown where it's no longer Jack the man. It's Jack driven by the needs of the hotel. And then even a, a, a stretch later, uh, there's a confrontation. Instead of the, of Danny leading him into the maze, he leads him up to the third um, floor of the hotel and he corners him and he presents to him a face uh, uh, bereft of fear and presents him with a scenario where he has to evoke his empathy, his human side. And the human side of Jack comes out again and, and tells the boy to get out. But just like that, the hotel, which has already manipulated him, tortured his mind and made him so paranoid that it's driven him to insanity takes control of him again and Jack bashes his own, his own face in with a mallet because in the book it's a mallet it's not a an axe bashes his own face in destroying the facade of Jack and just being something horrible and monstrous and it's such a shocking scene in the book but I think that exact scene is duplicated in the movie in that series of events where she hits him with a bat and at that point I don't know if you noticed it there is kind of a switch to something a lot more animalistic than we had seen before. And then uh, as he's led into the maze, there's a point where he's just blathering. You know, he's yeah. not even talking anymore. He's just driven to to kill. You know, uh, I think that scene is mirrored there. And I say mirrored on purpose, Kubrick style. Well, not that, but uh, I say mirrored because nothing we do is the theme of masks is brought up in the book because there is a masked ball in, in you know, which we kind of see glimpses of in the in the movie, but it's not elaborated upon. There's a masked ball. And the idea is that Jack, the man, is putting on a mask of a man. But that ghost of his alcoholism, that ghost of his uh anger yeah. yeah and his petulant self is always lingering in the back and they even draw parallels with a wasp nest uh kind of like a little subplot and stuff like that uh but the mask thing is a big thing so when he bashes his own face off he's literally taking off the mask you know all those themes are very prominent it would have been amazing to see those themes yeah. in the movie but again i think kubrick's uh, uh, kubrick was definitely trying to be a lot more vague yeah uh I don't know if you'll agree with this or not, and I certainly do. And it's King did point out that Kubrick was not in touch with his humanity. As a result, the characters come off as very detached. Would you say that that's what you feel when you see Jack and the family? Uh, I don't know what he means by detached. Emotionally detached uh, from each other. From Yeah, I thought that was intentional, though. Yes. Because everybody's uh, kind of doing their own thing. Yeah. And that's something that doesn't exist in the book. They are very much a family unit. Wendy is not a mousy pushover. She is much more involved. She, she has that motherly protective spirit of yeah. Danny. Danny is a super essential part of the book. He is the way we know what's going on with the hotel. His visions, his premonitions tell us a lot conversely jack we rarely see in the book in comparison to the other two so his madness happens in the background yeah kubrick flipped that around yeah I, and his madness happens that, at the foreground i will say that that was one thing i picked up in the movie i was like i'm assuming this kid is much more important in the original story. oh yes definitely um but yeah that like even without knowing the book i was like i assumed that much mm -hmm. so yeah it's interesting to have that confirmed yeah, and and it works wonderfully in the book, but I think it also works in a completely different yeah. way in the movie. We do get that other angle. And uh, it's interesting because at the time that King wrote The Shining, he was going through problems with alcohol and hatred, unfounded hatred of his own family. 
So in a lot of ways, The Shining is an autobiographical novel of him exercising his demons onto the page. So Jack would be the parallel of King, a man who wants to do good by his family, but is being torn away from that. His humanity is being torn away by his addictions, in this case, personified by the hotel, which becomes his new addiction. That's something they don't show in the movie, how Jack becomes so obsessed with the hotel that that leads him down the path of the hotel manipulating yeah, it's definitely him. definitely not in the movie. In the it, movie, he's just kind of like, yeah, I like it. Yeah, it replaces his alcoholism. However, in the movie, see, this is the thing. Kubrick found a substitute for everything. In the movie, the hotel is given a voice, not only through Lloyd, which initially gives us the impression that Jack, Lloyd being the bartender, yeah. that Jack himself is feeding his own mania, but then through Grady, the uh, yeah. butler being literally the voice of the hotel, driving him to do things. And that, you know, again, that's when it becomes to become a bit more clear that there is a supernatural element to this, despite how psychological the thing, the, the movie is. So whatever he took out from the novel Kubrick, he replaced in some way or another in the movie. Completely different in a lot of ways, and yet at the same time, he paralleled everything almost. Here's something that, again, that is not in the movie. I mean, I'm sorry, that is not in the book. That is in the movie and actually clears up a lot more. And this is what we'll get into what you think uh, ultimately is the meaning of this or not. And uh, really, there's no right or wrong answer unless you say something like, I think it's about Slimer, then obviously you're wrong. But... Oh, man, that was my theory. <laughs> well, you're wrong. But anyway, there, there, there really is no right or wrong answer uh, because there is so many possibilities that he lays out there mm. but one thing that the movie does suggest not only through dialogue at the beginning but through the uh, the scenes being shot and the set dressings in those scenes because Kubrick again was very meticulous everything that wasn't a shot he made sure it was where he wanted it to be nothing was by accident everything was by design so, the book lets us know that the hotel... Okay, let me before I explain that, let me go back to Salem's Lot, which we would explore before. In Salem's Lot, the book, King introduces the idea of a place where much evil happens will attract evil. In, in Salem's Lot, it's the Marston House and the town of Salem's Lot. Because so much history of evil has happened in the Marston House, evil is attracted to it. Well, he elaborates on that idea here, but the idea here is that in a place where much evil happens, evil begins to gain sentience. The hotel is alive, and it seeks to keep itself alive. It seeks to keep adding souls to it. But when, and it's done it, it's done it with the previous caretakers, it's done it with the many events in the hotel that have happened, which are not explored in the movie, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and it's, basically created like a depository of souls to keep itself alive and it attracts the right people too so it attracts jack not only by the circumstances of the life that have led him there because you know he lost his job and he needs this particular job but because there is something there's some sort of fatalism in it and it attracts him there and drives him to the edge by exploiting his weaknesses but the hotel wants Danny more because of The Shining. The Shining, being the psychic array of powers, amplifies the hotel's reach and makes it more powerful, more sentient. It's hungry. Which it is wants. why it sends him after him? Yes. The kid? Yeah, that makes sense. Now, mind you, it's killed before, yeah. but to keep itself alive, to keep itself going. But now that it's come across somebody with that much power of The Shining, it really wants Danny. So, yes, you're absolutely right. That is the motivation here in the book. In the movie, it makes sense with the movie too. Yeah, it, oh, absolutely, yeah. it does. Yeah, it's just not as upfront in the movie, yeah. as, if you will. In the movie, they introduced an interesting concept, which, by the way, King later used in uh, you know several books, most notably Pet Cemetery, and it's the idea that the hotel is in fact infested with ghosts, but that the root of it might be the fact that one it's a history piece of land you know and we could go back into american history to know what that means and two on top of that 
it was built on top of an Indian cemetery. And there are many visual clues throughout the movie. The most striking to me has always been uh, when Jack is locked, when Wendy locks Jack in the pantry and he's, you know, he begins to hear Grady on the other side of the door and Grady is basically telling him, you failed and he's trying to convince Grady to let him out. Uh, as Grady, i.e., in essence, the hotel, is telling him, is coaxing him to go over the edge to do it, to kill them, right next to Jack's head, or right behind him, are a row of Calumet baking powder cans, and they have Indian heads on them. And then earlier in the movie, of course, we see him uh, almost viciously angrily throwing the ball towards yeah. Indian um, tapestries on the wall. There's a lot of things that suggest yeah, the whole, yeah, the whole, really, the whole um, place has like this kind of decor, yeah, like yeah, Indian. And uh, I think really this is the supernatural explanation to what's going on here. Uh, even more evidence when. Uh, the double entendre of him referring uh, when he asks for a drink from the imaginary bartender uh, and refers to it as the white man's burden. Mm. You know, all these things, all these elements suggest that this is the vengeance of the ancients playing itself out on the people that have descended there, that have come there, the the white man, if you will, that have that have that have wronged those people. But then there's also the idea that there might be a whole reincarnation uh, element to this. The idea, and again, this is emphasized by that last shot, and I don't know if this is where you were going. Yeah, that's exactly what yeah. I was thinking. I, mine was, well, well... No, go ahead, go ahead. Mine was more like, I kind of saw it, since it's so kind of like vague and psychological, like you said, I thought it was kind of like a personal hell type of thing. Like things just yes. kind of restart. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, there's a bit in the beginning where they say that uh, I forgot exactly what he says, but it was something with the evil, like you know things happen, mm -hmm. and then he says I can't believe it's happened this long ago, and then you start seeing exactly the same thing that happened to that guy happened to him, and then when he's talking to Grady and he says, and he that entire thing I was like, the flip, because it seemed like you know. It seemed like that, like he was yeah. taking the place, like, and it was just kind of restarting. And then uh, again, and you're absolutely, and you, you could a hundred, and I, I know because I've seen that idea there too. You know, it just, again, per viewing almost, it's like you could get a completely different idea of what this is, yeah. which is awesome. But uh, yeah, I, I, I've been there too, and I completely support that that could very well be. Really, what I think it is is he interweaved a hundred million ideas into yeah. one movie. Uh, but yeah, you're absolutely right. That is one of the big theories, and that is that this guy, yeah, in essence, is is either reincarnated and being reclaimed by the hotel, or is living out a fate, is just another face that has been there before, so yeah. to speak. Oh, that's what it was. It was like something so evil that it's not that it leaves something in, in time or whatever. They yeah. say something like that earlier on. I mm -hmm. was kind of like. That's interesting line to say. Yeah. And then later on when he's talking to that dude, he's like, this is an interesting interaction. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, it, it, again, very purposeful. And it's interesting to note that almost 100% of the dialogue is new. You know, mm -hmm. a lot, there's hardly anything that's in the novel that's in the story, in the movie. So, yes, very purposeful. And I think that idea is all the more underlined when you think about the original ending. It just really adds substance to that yeah. concept. So, yeah, absolutely, man. But again, there are a million theories. Uh, some go off the wall wacky. Some are just little things because on top of big themes, Kubrick would also throw in little Easter eggs, I will say, little what ideas. The, what the flip was up with that bear guy? Uh, okay, uh, in the movie, it's a dog man. But <laughs> oh, it's a dog? No, and in, in, I'm sorry, in the in the book, it's Wait, a dog man. Wait, it happens man. in the book? Yeah. I assume that was one of Kubrick's weird things. No, uh, it is one of Kubrick's weird things, and here's the thing. Uh, how can I explain it? Okay, in the book, it's just another ghost, 
And Danny's actually the one that sees him, not Wendy. Mm -hmm. When Wendy sees all that stuff at the end, I think that's Kubrick's way of telling the audience, this is a supernatural. Yeah, yeah. Uh, conversely, in the movie, we know it's... I mean, I'm sorry, in the book, we know it's supernatural. So Danny sees the dog man, and it's just one of the many ghosts that reside in the Overlook. And he's actually expounded upon in the book, and the dog man was one of the... Basically, okay. Basically, the guy that originally, one of the people that uh, that re renovated the hotel, uh, was a homosexual, and he had these bizarre oh, fucking parties, and, like sucking that yeah, dude for off? the uh, yeah for the elite uh, okay. and all that stuff. Okay, and there's a whole subplot about those particular ghosts in the in the book that's not even touched upon in the movie, which makes it except even for that one scene. Yeah. But see, here's the thing. That one scene, first of all, is very alarming when you see it. Yeah, it is. It's... It was effective. It was yeah. just like, what the flip is this? So on a strictly horror level, yeah, it, you're like, what the fuck? It's so yeah, alarming, disorienting, weird, out of place, you know? But on top of that, there is a whole line of thought. And I, I even t told you about how disturbing this can be if you actually get into that line of thought while watching the movie. There's a whole line of thought that there was precedent to believe that Jack was not only abusive physically, but sexually towards Danny. And uh, there are scenes in the movie that suggest this. One that stands out immediately if you're watching the movie is how terse the relationship is. Yeah, Danny's so rigid around him, so afraid to emote. Jack, on the other hand, comes off as menacing in his attempts to interact with Danny. Yeah, that is weird, especially during that scene where he, where he walks in and then yeah, Jack's yeah. Just sitting the fire there truck. It's, yeah. yeah, it's really weird. It, yeah, it's it's unsettling, and the fact that it cuts right after that tells you something. This was intentional for one, uh, and on top of that, there are other things that suggested when when the psychologist is talking to him. He refers to Tony being in his mouth and going into his stomach. You know, there's just yeah. su subliminal suggestions that there might be something that... And he's so reticent to talk about Tony, which is something that he's not in the book. He's pretty open about Tony in the book. Tony, it turns out, of course, and they make this pretty clear in the movie, I think, anyway, unless he got a different expression. Tony is, of course, Danny himself. But it's that part of him that he shuts down, that he doesn't want the world... And the question rises, why would he want to shut that down? Where in the book, he does not. And again, it suggests that there might be something yeah. else there. And on top of that, there's scenes. Uh, it's like the memories you put away. Yeah, you, exactly. Yeah. And uh, everybody knows that, that Kubrick was fucking anal about the way he shot shit. He wanted it to be a certain way, and that was it. You know? So no shot is accidental. So it's interesting to note that... Uh, there's a theme of parallels here. The mirrors, the twins, Grady, and Jack. There's a theme of parallels throughout this whole movie. There's also a theme of parallels in terms of shots. And two shots that match are Danny brushing his teeth with foam all over his mouth, bent over as the shot uh, aims towards the door. And the shot that parallels that? The bear man giving a blowjob to the guy. Bear the, guy. So a lot of people think that there is a, a subtext of child yeah. abuse in there. That also kind of adds to the way he kind of dismisses the weird, the 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 attack that he has of the chick in the in the. Oh um, yeah, yeah. Where he's just like, maybe it was just another one of those things. You know, those things that happen, trying to excuse it or whatever. Yeah. Um. In the book, that comes off as his. Inability to accept reality, and also at the same time, that part of his mind that has accepted that the hotel is yeah. there. I think in the movie, ultimately it paints the picture that Jack has become enamored. I will say with, that, yeah, yeah, that 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 may that. But if you want to really look into that weird, yeah, yeah, sexual thing, yeah, that definitely. can be one of you know how. Yeah. Yeah. That's Again, multi-layered. You know, a lot of. Uh, yeah, but I think the the express purpose of that, or I should say, the the biggest intent behind that scene was to demonstrate something that in the book takes so long to demonstrate, and it's the idea that he's become uh, obsessed with the hotel, but at the same time is terrified by it when you know she turns it back into the hag. Yeah. Uh, which doesn't happen in the book at all. So I again, very intentional. Says a lot of things with that and with what you just brought up. Uh, 
a gazillion different things. But anyway, we cleared all that air out. Let's get into the tiny things real quick. Actors is a big one here because it all rests on the shoulders of actors being isolated in a fucking hotel. Yeah. Our three core actors are, of course, uh, I forgot the kid's name who played uh, Danny Torrance, but his name was Danny something. Right. And uh, Shelley Duvall is Wendy Torrance, the wife, and Jack Nicholson in one of his career defining roles as Jack Torrance. What do you think about the. Oh, and, uh, lest I forget. Oh, yeah. How Scatman you, Crothers. How can you forget about the scat? As uh, apparently just scatting, yep. Um, as uh, uh, Dick Halloran, uh, what do you think overall of the cast? I think everybody was really good. I think that some of the um, not not wooden because I don't want to say wooden. Some of the kind of odd acting actually fit into the movie really well and kind of added to the uh, weird unease. Yeah, like you said, the weird uh disconnected mm-hmm, mm-hmm. feel of the movie so i have no complaints i will say that multiple times while watching this i was like man jack nicholson would be a good joker and then i was like oh crap that happened and it sucked <laughs> yep that wasn't good yeah but yeah man uh, i'm with you on this uh fucking great acting throughout and like like you said uh i mean I, if i were to complain about some of the acting it'd be you know secondary character ter- tertiary characters really that are just kind of set dressing to move something along Dogman? like that really gay that, oh, that obviously gay guy uh, you know that gets called by yeah. by dick uh coincidentally but yeah. oh, maybe uh, that was intentional oh well, there you go yeah but uh yeah man uh the 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 core set of actors here is amazing and again yeah the, the any awkwardness only amplifies yeah. how strange you feel about everything uh there is not a moment in this movie which is something you can't say about the book because there is a point where you do like Jack in the book. Mm. Uh, even when he's at the brink of madness, at full hold of the hotel, you still see that inkling of humanity in him. Every moment in this movie, Jack Nicholson it's, as Torrance is unsettling. It's pretty interesting because even in the like you said, even in the beginning when he's when they're telling him about the tragedy that happened there, and he's just kind of like, yeah, very cool, nonchalant, I guess. yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting. He even makes like a little joke about it too. Yeah. Yeah, he does. And, uh, I mentioned earlier that, that King wrote this while he was suffering through his own alcoholism and rage issues towards his family. So it's very autobi- autobiographical to him, the book. I think that Jack is a reflection, just like Jack in the book is a reflection of King. I think Jack in the movie is a reflection of Kubrick, a controlling tyrant. Wow. And if you look back at Kubrick's movies, especially stuff like A Clockwork Orange and stuff like that, uh, HAL 9000 in, in, in 2001 A Space Odyssey, some of the uh, central characters are just him. You know, this, this projection of him, this raging tyrant. I think maybe, I would even venture to say Kubrick it was so self-aware that he did that on purpose. But if kinda, he didn't, it still works. It even yeah, it even kind of fits when you when you mention the fact that his directing career had kind of gone in a weird mm-hmm, direction. Uh, yeah. Direction and and he's just like a frustrated dude. Oh yeah, absolutely. He's just like obsessed with his work. And I think and you can't come up with something that people will like. Yes, it fits uh, perfectly. Brilliant. Uh, you know the the writer's block scene. Yeah, that's not in the book, but it's in the movie. Yeah. It's one of the most legendary scenes in cinema. All work. And no play make Jack a dual boy. But that was Kubrick that did that. That was yeah. not King. You know, genius. But yes, I think you're absolutely right. I think you hit that nail on the head. It is a reflection of him. And uh, I think Kubrick was very self aware about that. And uh, I think this goes back to when he found the novel. According to his secretary, they had brought him hundreds of novels. And he would sit in his office and read. And just give up and throw them at the wall. Angry that he wasn't finding the right thing. And then she said that eventually she stopped hearing books hitting the wall. And she went in to check. And he was knee deep in The Shining. And he said, this is it. This is the one. So again, I think very intentional. Mm. I think you are absolutely right. Uh, But we could be wrong. That's Mm. the thing. That's what's beautiful about it. So yeah, but anyway, getting back to the characters and the actors they portray. I'm sorry. The actors and the characters they portray. Everybody's spot on. Our core group of actors is amazing. I do wish that Dick 
had gotten more to do in the book. He gets a badass fucking... Uh, he doesn't die, for one. Yeah, I assume that was also a change. But, check this out. A lot of people that love the book hate that Dick dies in the movie. But I think that is the one moment where Jack cannot be brought back. Yeah. That he kills him, that's the one moment where he, where he can't be brought back. So I know why he killed him. I think it's necessary in the movie considering only, how many changes were made. Not only that, but at that point it added like a, well, these people are screwed. Yeah, yeah, really, yeah. Uh, that being said, it would be incredibly neat to see Dick do all that he does in the in the movie, in the book, I'm sorry. Uh, but some of those elements didn't even exist in the movie, i.e. the hedge animals, yeah. which are, in the movie are just a maze. Uh, you know, seeing Dick fight and burn those fucking things off would be cool. Seeing Jack uh, take the mallet to his wife would have been incredible to see. But it would the movie that had been made up to that point wouldn't lend to those scenes happening. So it would have made no sense to put them in there. Uh, fortunately, we did get to see those movies later in the TV miniseries, Woo! which was made out of spite by Stephen King. He said, fuck this, I'm going to get my vision on screen. And then he hired the wrong guy to do it. But we'll get stuff. to that one. We'll get to that one when we get to that one. Spoiler. It's shit. It's not great, but we may the change our minds. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the, the uh, visual style in this movie. Uh, this was one of the first group of movies that used Steadicam. Uh, so pronounced. And then, you know, yeah. almost every shot is Steadicam. Yeah. And it's gorgeous. It's amazing, man. Uh, not just the Steadicam shots, but everything. Uh, beautifully framed. Everything looks it, it starts amazing. With like, like these shots going. The about, helicopter yeah. shots. Yeah. I was kind of like, damn, that's pretty impressive for the time. And even for now, it's pretty impressive. Yeah. Just the way they're framed. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like the whole movie is like the camera is always moving, but not in a shitty Michael Bay way. In a kind of interesting, like there's this whole shot where they're talking to the guy in the, in the, the hotel guy and he's giving him a little tour. And it's just following them the whole time. And it's going behind things. And yeah. It's just really cool looking. Yeah. Uh, and many people have tipped their hats to that. Uh, Sam Raimi, uh, et cetera. There's just tons of people have tipped their hats to shots in this movie. Uh, to the way it was used. And it revolutionized the use of Steadicam. Uh, in fact, the guy that created Steadicam worked on this movie. And refined his skill with it under the you know, tyrannical tutelage well, Stanley Kubrick. So, I mean, it goes without saying that the fucking thing looks amazing. It's spectacularly shot, framed, uh, lit. Uh, and speaking of lighting, this is a horror movie that does not rely on darkness. Yeah. To get the terror across. Which, again, another cliche bear breaking strike from Kubrick himself. Um, let's talk about the score real quick. Uh, as was common with Kubrick, he just chose musical selections told somebody put them in the right place and that somebody was just as anal as he was about things and uh, lo and behold they somehow found a way to perfectly fit things in so you already know what i think about this on top of that there was some original score uh stuff added into the mix to accentuate other scenes here and there but mostly it's stuff that's that, that were existing uh I would say for the most part, it's this droning kind of like heartbeat sound. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like drums throughout, which I really liked. Yeah. And then you do get those little selections and the occasional little music swell. But a lot of the movies, especially as it gets, if it, as it, as it gets going, is a lot of that kind of like droning little sound, which I like. I like droning yeah. little yeah. sounds. It adds to the unease. Spectacular atmospheric effect created by this. Uh, anyway, uh, <clears throat> it's interesting to note that some of the most iconic shots in this movie had nothing to do with the novel. Some of the most iconic elements in this had nothing to do with the novel. Again, we mentioned the manuscript scene. That was entirely Kubrick. The twins, entirely Kubrick. The blood coming out the elevator, entirely Kubrick. The order of events entirely kubrick he just switched everything around and then gutted everything and restructured it there's so much in here like i said initially this is very much stanley kubrick's the shining uh but 
one last thing to touch on, and that's the, I wouldn't say effects in this movie, but uh, much more the action set pieces, the horror set pieces, the scares, if you will. Uh, what was your overall impression of that? Anything you didn't like, anything you did love, or whatever? I mean, as it comes to, like, s scares, there really isn't many, like, scare scares. It's more like eerie imagery mm -hmm. so when it comes to eerie imagery it's pretty top yeah i would say i, I, I would i would find the the action being more like just the camera really because it's always moving mm -hmm. uh which again is really good uh this movie has something incredibly special about it and it's well it has a lot of things that are special about it but one of the things that really sticks out for me is that it has the distinct uh privilege of being a movie that is incredibly claustrophobic yeah, while, ha yeah, place, yeah. while having these amazingly large space to dwell in uh, and that is such a feat to achieve you know it, it's pretty amazing that they did that uh, it just works it just works so wonderfully well uh, but in terms of the uh, set pieces in this, yes, it's much more about our knees. It's much more about atmosphere. It's much more about building up tension mm. and then giving you the sudden shock. Uh, not like a jump scare. No, not at all. But just, uh, again, a disturbing shock. Like, again, the, the bear man scene. It's so out of place. It's so strange. It's so alarming. So, I don't know, man. It, it just completely takes the rug out from under you you know where you're ah, what was that uh even little things like the premonitions of the yeah. elevator blood flow you know all that stuff is, is spades man it's awesome I, I love it uh but anyway one final piece of trivia for you here did you know that jack one was hated by stephen king and to the day that they started shooting this Stephen King was like, don't hire that guy. Jack Nicholson? Yeah, because, and he makes a good point. His point was, he looks insane. He does look insane. But again, I think that was Kubrick's intent. Yeah. You know, and, and on top of that, he had just done, not, not too long before that, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. So, insanity was already, yeah. like, inherent with Jack. And then on top of that, he just looks like the devil, you know. Who has pointy fucking eyebrows naturally? But anyway, again, I, if 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 uh, Batman had come like I don't know what twenty years earlier, he would have been really good. Oh yeah, old too bad. Uh, older Jack, not so great. He wasn't great when he was old. Uh, uh, but yeah, man, he, uh, Stephen King hated him, but he was Kubrick's first choice. Here's an interesting little assortment though for you. You can't always get the person you want in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. So there were alternatives to Jack. Gary Busey. And I'm going to run... Oh, that would have been weird. <laughs> I mean, he would have been crazy from the beginning. Yeah, but he would have. I'm going to give you a little list of alternatives. And uh, these are actual alternatives to Jack. And you're going to tell me if you think they would work. Would you like to see that or not? Or any opinions you might have. All right. The uh, first alternative was Robert De Niro. Oh, that's interesting. I think that would have worked really well. Because he could play... Uh, I mean, if you're going for the more Kingian way, he could be really likable, and then he could play really insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. I don't know about for this movie. But... I love De Niro, but man, he, he's one of those people that has been forever stained by being in like gangster movies. Well, so it's like if you remove uh, yourself from that, yeah, yeah, it been yeah it's really hard for me personally. So of the choices, the alternatives, he would be my least favorite pick. All right. Uh, but of course, you know, I love De Niro yeah. and obviously he's done other movies that are not like that. Yeah. Meet the Fockers. Fuck no. But, uh, you know, like Taxi Driver is a good example. Yeah, that's... But again, he plays a very, you know, street level blue collar type of guy. So yeah. I don't know if it would have fit, but it would have been interesting for sure. Another one was Harrison Ford. Ah, oh, that's yeah. weird. I think this one would have been interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he would have definitely approached the insanity a lot more subtly mm -hmm. or maybe not because kubrick would have demanded something else maybe out of he him, would just but... play himself because apparently he's insane in real life yeah true uh so uh what do you think overall ford it's de weird. niro I can't... is de niro still i think de niro's above because i think de niro okay. especially at the time would have been interesting to see yeah, him in that I agree, role i agree uh here you go uh this is an actual alternative at the time not well now not now but at the time 
it, it, it would have been wild and weird that this would even happen. All right. And oddly suitable considering who, who he would have been working with. And that is Robin Williams. What? He was an alternative at the time. Yeah. That's weird. Now he worked with Shelley Duvall and Popeye. <laughs> That's a good point. So, the but whole it, time would have been, oh, Jack, <laughs> please don't, Jack. That is so weird. I will say this is an interesting parallel. They, uh, Jack Nicholson was offered the part of the Joker. I mean, uh, Robin Williams was offered the yep. part of the Joker in, yep. in order to lure Jack Nicholson. That's true. The uh, thing is, at the time, of course, Robin Williams was just renowned for basically TV work, yeah, and very limited on the you know on the film work, and it was all very comedy oriented. In fact, that would be the case up until the mid nineties. We all know 90s. he actually had some dramatic chops on him. I don't know if oh, they yeah. were I don't know if they were honed back then. Disclaimer: I fucking for the most part hate Robin Williams' comedic roles. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I, yeah. I love a, a handful of them, but. For the most part, I fucking hate. I hate his comedy, his stand-up comedy. I, yeah. I, I even dare say I come close to hating the man at some point. <laughs> I was about to say, you don't yeah. hate the man. You just yeah. like, All But right. uh, in terms of his dramatic skills, He's really he good, is yeah. amazing, man. Uh, one of my favorite roles from him was One Hour Photo, where he, he plays a very sympathetic uh, psycho, basically. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love him in dramas. He's amazing in dramas. Or I guess was amazing because yeah. he's fucking dead. Dead as shit, if you will. <laughs> but anyway, what do you think? Dude, at the time, it would have been pretty strange, huh? It would have been weird. As, again, I don't know if his dramatic chops would have been up to par, but it would have been really interesting to see. It would have been. It would have been interesting to see how insane Kubrick yeah. would have driven him. But uh, anyway, he probably would have uh, Robin Williams a lot earlier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh, man, on the set, it's hanging and shit, <laughs> haunting some hotel. Whoa! Anyway, this took a turn. <laughs> anyway, uh. So, yeah, this movie went on to become, of course, not only a cult classic, but a legendary movie. Uh, it is now incredibly well regarded. Mm -hmm. Critics that initially hated now laud it and applaud it, and rightfully so. Um, as an adaptation, final rating and final thoughts, by the way, as an adaptation, as an adaptation, like if I read this, which I did, and I wanted this on screen, <laughs> I'd give this a fucking zero. <laughs> no, nah, I'd give it like a two. As an adaptation. As an adaptation. I wouldn't deny its genius. In terms of its genius, I would give it, you know, still obviously a fucking high ass grade. But in terms of an adaptation, I would say this is ass. <laughs> However, <laughs> as, a, as a standalone film, uh -huh. as a piece of fucking art, this is a damn 10 and it's fantastic. Definitely worth your time. Awesome. Final thoughts? Stephen King wanted Michael Moriarty to be Jack, and I think that would have been amazing in an adaptation of this. But that's not what this was. But anyway, hit it. I think it's really good. I think uh, that it's it's definitely not something that's been done since. And mm -hmm. I don't think will ever be done again. Um, very unique. And uh, I feel bad giving it anything less than a 10. Mm -hmm. That being said, comma... I do have to see this more than once. Yeah, because I agree. Because whilst watching it, my head was hurting a little. Just trying to piece shit together. There is a pressure to watching Kubrick films. There is. And because it, it was everybody... weird because I felt it before you even put the movie. I was oh, like, yeah. oh, man, we're going to watch And you know what? It's shining. I was trying to downplay it as much as possible. Yeah. Not mentioning it. Not and I knew it, though. Yeah, other than the fact that I told you we're going to watch The Shining next like, week. I was like, oh, man. You know, because I was reading the book. And uh, other than that, I tried to not discuss it, to which, not talk about it, because there is which is funny, an inherent it's pressure. Exact in same Cooper. thing you did with uh, Clockwork Orange. We just started watching it, and I was yeah. like, "Hey, that was really cool, or really yeah. uh, good." I'm gonna say cool. It's, it's not a cool guy that the, I want to be him. It's it, just a cool. A it's good movie. always the case, man. It's always the case uh, I've encountered when when I've watched a Kubrick movie. There is that pressure, and if you're watching it with someone that already knows it, it's amplified times ten. Because nobody, whether they like Kubrick or not, can deny that the man, at the very least, was a technical genius. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's the thing. I was uh, before we even started this, I was like, I'm gonna say this, and I had forgotten until you said that. Even if I didn't like this movie, like even if I thought it sucked donkey nuts, I would still say you should watch it, mm -hmm. just from a technical standpoint. Yeah. Because it is it is really impressive visually and what they accomplished for the time. That being said. 
I did thoroughly enjoy the movie. So it's kind of hard on a on, on like a technical film, art film scale. I would give it a perfect ten. On a personal enjoyment, I will give it a nine point five because again I have to see it again. Yeah, because there was different. a little bit of a of a woo. We're gonna watch this. Yeah, the pressure was on. But I will say this: if you love the book as I do, uh, Stephen King said, "I'm gonna." I'm going to get someone to actually, you know, adapt the book loyally. He got Mick Garris to do that, who was a friend of his, and who had previously adapted The Stand in a relatively well-received and, you know, worthy adaptation, albeit it was a TV adaptation, so it had limitations. It had massive but, uh, suits. It, it, it was a pretty great adaptation, despite its limitations, despite, you know, some of its flaws. Uh, so he he knocked on old Mick Garris' door and said, Hey! Want to direct The Shining? Mick Garris said yes. Turns out, not a great idea. Nope. At least that was my impression back then. And that seems to be most people's impression. But we will revisit that in due time and talk about that and rate it. But if you read the book, it did spawn a sequel from Stephen King himself called Doctor Sleep, which takes place, you know, it, over two decades later, he, he wrote this. And it is, I got to say, one of the most satisfying follow ups to anything ever. Unlike the movie, the book does not, unlike the movie The Shining, the book The Shining does not end so vaguely, does not, it not end in such a sour downturn note. Uh, there is closure mm. in, in the book, and it is relatively satisfying, but it does leave you wondering, what are the after effects on this boy and the family? And how does this boy continue to live with his gift? And the answer is, in Doctor Sleep, which is, like I said, an incredibly, incredibly satisfying sequel. It is, interestingly, being uh, uh, made into a movie. It's currently in pre-production as of January of this year uh, from Mike Flanagan. And we shall see. Uh, Kiva Goldsman is involved in oh, it. No. So hopefully that doesn't ruin it. But Mike Flanagan's great, so we'll see where that goes. Now, is um, it going to acknowledge the film? Or is it just going to be a sequel to the book? I, I, I'm I'm hoping it's it's the book, and they have the way this 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 novel is written. You don't have to read The Shining oh, okay. to understand what's going on. Uh, you know the character lets you know what happened in so many ways. But if you read the novel, of course, it you know the payoff is ten thousand times better, especially when it comes down to its conclusion, and we see certain hanging chads of emotion snipped at the bud and it's pretty great uh novel an excellent follow-up uh i think very underappreciated a lot of people dismiss current king because they're fools i think he is in another golden age in his career and this is one of those books that proves it so check that out if you haven't read it yet if you've read the original novel very very cool very unique on its own i give that a 10 and we'll see how the movie turns out and hopefully it'll yeah. be great uh um, if uh, I remember correctly, Flanagan is the person behind Gerald's game, so yeah, should be good unless Keith Goldman gets his hands on it. So anyway, uh, that's uh, been it. You, this one is a definite hit for Stephen King adaptations, yeah. uh, or not for adaptations, but no, for, uh, for a film in general. Yeah, this but, is um, kind of a hard one. Yeah, as an adaptation, it is. it's shit. As a film, it's yeah, a hit. but it's definitely a hit film. It's it's worth your time worth a watch check it out if you haven't checked out thanks for staying with us hit like share subscribe and those notification buttons for more movie madness videos and of course random bullshit videos which we are kind of known for now yep. but anyway this has been ahab and the goon tick bye fun fact they could have watched about half of the movie half of the shining instead or, of this fucking video or watch this review <laughs> and if you made it to here sorry <laughs>